So for how many of you, is this your last day here in Hong Kong? Everybody's going up, and you're all flying out tonight. Cool. We get tomorrow afternoon to go play and, and, and look around and see a little bit of Hong Kong. We haven't got out too much, so this is all good. So we're going to get started here in a minute, so come on in and sit down. Um, I want to start really quickly and on time um, because um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Diane Mueller. I am the OpenShift Cloud Evangelist for OpenShift Origin um, at Red Hat, and I'm the Origin Community Manager. Um, and I did a presentation with this very same name in Portland six months ago. And instead of doing me talking um, this time, because a lot has happened since we were in Portland um, all together. How many of you were in Portland? Okay, pretty good, pretty good. Um, how many came to my presentation? Anybody? Yes. Thank you. So this time, and when we were in Portland, um, we were talking a lot about OpenShift, and we did demos in the keynotes and everything. And this time, we're going to talk about what we've done since then with Heat, um, with Docker. We have um, uh, Sam Alba in the middle. And, um, and now, Salom. Am I saying it right? Solum. Solum. All right, I'll get there. I just double the O or something. So um, my agenda today, <laughs> my agenda today is to, tell you, to get you to understand very quickly why PaaS matters on OpenStack. Um, and how you can get your PaaS on um, on OpenStack today. And then we're going to switch over really quickly. And I have a bunch of questions that I've prepped for these guys. But then I'm expecting you all to earn your beer openers and um, ask some questions too. So um, we'll, we'll get going pretty good uh, because there's a lot of work going on. So what this um, presentation is really all about is cross-community collaboration. You've seen um, a lot of different projects come out of OpenStack. You've seen Red Hat work on, you've got people, we've got people at Red Hat working on all sorts of different parts and pieces of OpenStack. Um, and we, there's over 100,000 now um, projects that someone at Red Hat works on. Uh, uh, there was, uh, somebody showed me a spreadsheet once. It's way too tiny type to show you guys. But um, we've really been working very hard to com um, collaborate across all of those um, communities within Red Hat and outside of that. And this is really a bit of what this panel represents. And so we've got a huge commitment, as you know, to OpenStack. And I, Origin is our platform as a service. So um, raise your hand. Sam is from Docker. He's got the right t-shirt on, Sam Alba. Um, Chris Alfonso from Red Hat, Krishna, and Adrian Otto from Rackspace. And the short man on the end is uh, Clay Coleman. So. Um, we're really going to talk about how we did all this together. But to set the stage a little bit, in my humble opinion, and I'm going to help you try and drink the Kool-Aid today, that platform as a service is a key to any cloud initiative, whether it's OpenStack, private, public, hybrid. Having that platform as a service is really what's going to make your cloud initiative a success. And so most of us are all here um, for OpenStack for good reasons. And we're all still very focused on delivering that cloud infrastructure. And the OpenStack community has done an awesome, awesome job delivering a wonderful open source cloud infrastructure. And all of the magic and all the pieces and the parts are there. And we're all working on them together. But there's something a little missing for me, um, and I think for a lot of developers. Um, a lot of developers, we, we really have come to expect with public pauses like Heroku and OpenShift Online, the ability to just have an idea, code it, test it, repeat until we get it right. Um, and sometimes launch before we get it right, and then have it scale for us automatically. And when we're just delivering um, the infrastructure um, and unboxing it, and when you unbox just OpenStack, the deployment experience for our application as developers, and there's a reason why my Twitter handle is Python DJ. I am a Python developer. I expect to be able to just, these days, um, it, everything's changed, to be able to do that really, really rapidly. I expect that self-service on-demand platform. I expect to be able to really be productive almost instantaneously and get those resources without waiting at all. And that's the expectation. It's like you go at Christmas time and you're unboxing and un the gift wrapping that cloud that somebody has wonderfully deployed inside of your enterprise or on some hosted private virtual cloud with OpenStack. And then you get there, and there's still work to do to get that application up and running. And so what I like to say is that platform as a service, you've all seen the layer cake, is what really fills in the meat on top of that from a developer's perspective. From a sysadmin or an operations 
um, getting those cloud compute resources and doing what um, infrastructure as a service does so well. Um, OpenStack delivers that. But when I unbox OpenStack, I really think that the next stage um, of the evolution is putting a platform as a service on it. And that's the magic that OpenShift develop, uh, uh, delivers today. We're delivering that on um, OpenStack and on bare metal and on AWS. And all of that's, it's Apache V2. All of the source code to do that today is out there on GitHub. So if you want to fork it, work with us, collaborate on it. Uh, we would love to have you come and do that with us. There's lots of flavors of OpenShift. Um, the origin project, which I'm the community manager for, is what upstream feeds uh, OpenShift Online and our enterprise offering. So we have lots of folks who are giving us feedback on it. And it's a constant, rather rapid evolution. Every three months, this man gets to help us with a new release cycle. So we're really rapidly iterating and working with the feedback from our communities. So, but six months ago, when I was in Portland, um, we did a keynote demo. I had anybody see the keynote? from Portland when Brian Stevens stood up there and showed off a little piece of video that actually worked and a little demo that actually worked. Um, and we took and used heat to deploy and start auto-scaling OpenShift natively on, um, on OpenStack. And that, our commitment at that time was to make sure that those templates were production ready and would be included in RDO and ROS um, in the upcoming releases. And I'm here to tell you we delivered on that. And if you go into the OpenStack heat templates, you'll see two sets of heat templates, one for enterprise and one for origin. And a lot of that is due to Krishna and Chris here's work that's been being done. So then that was six months ago. And then six months, in that six months time, a lot, of, a lot has happened. And Docker came along and we started collaborating. Um, we're really proud to be part of the Docker uh, project and working on that. We have people inside not just working on making sure that OpenShift works with Docker and um, will support Docker, but also contributing to the Docker project itself. And so we're really happy to be part of all of that. And then the solemn, solemn, or whatever you want to call it, project <laughs> happened. And, and when did you start that, Adrian? Like two, three weeks, four or five weeks? We, we started about October 1st was our first public meeting. Yep. Uh, we announced uh, the project to the OpenStack developer community about two weeks ago. All right, so this is really fresh. And so we wanted to um, talk today a little bit about how all of that works together. So we're really excited about that. So enough about OpenShift and PaaS or anything. What I, I've got a couple of questions. I want to talk a little bit, because I, what I see it is happening is we've done the heat work, right? And Krishna and Chris and Clayton on the end a little bit, too. Um, well, for Krish, the question I had for you is, you know, what, what made Red Hat decide to start doing these heat templates and why, and, and why was it important? So it actually makes good sense to use uh, OpenStack and get heat, everything on there. Um, getting an, a basic OpenShift set up online involves a lot of different pieces that need to be integrated with each other. And heat provides the perfect orchestration layer to uh, be able to do that. So with Heat, you can spin up um, the <clears throat> all of the support services like the DNS, uh, Mongo for data storage and such, as well as uh, the nodes that provide the API front end and uh, run all of the containers that uh, are part of the OpenShift service. Okay. So that was a perfect fit, and that's how we went. That's cool. So, and, but that, does that mean the puppet, the chef scripts, all go away? They don't, actually. So when we are spinning up the nodes um, using Heat, Heat, in turn, will trigger the Puppet scripts or Ansible. And um, there, there are also shell scripts to do all of this. So you can choose which one you want. And Heat will trigger those scripts to be able to set up Origin on there. Cool. So a quick question for Chris, then. Um, one of the things Chris has been work Chris Alfonso has been working on is making it work with enterprise and the enterprise strips. But I'm wondering because I know you've had run some into some limitations and some of the reasons why, um, you know, the limitations deploying a pause with heat. What was what were some of the issues you hit? I wouldn't really call what uh, them limitations. I would say that there's definitely some homework to do ahead of time. Uh, we we are in the midst of a lot of design iterations in OpenStack. Um, uh, for instance, 
going from Nova Networking to Neutron Networking, um, there are different resource mappings. Um, you can do, uh, you can specify in template uh, native uh, Neutron mappings rather than AWS based, um, I guess, resource mapped to Nova Networking. And, you know, it, we are in the midst of, of a lot of change. So there's some, some maintenance and some homework to do along the way. And um, one of the other things that uh, we, we discussed earlier this week was that uh, you really have to consider what the end result of your infrastructure is going to be in that if you want elasticity and quick elasticity, you have the burden of maintaining your images such that when they come online, they come online very quickly with all the security errata already updated and con as much configuration done as possible uh, ahead of time, mm -hmm. such that they, uh, the, the time to, to going live is, is very short. So, but that's really not heat related, and it's not really, um, I, I would just say that heat provides a, a great orchestration layer to, to um, carry out some of those maintenance items. But heat is, is not an, enough. To, I mean, then the next, the next phase of um, what we're doing with Solomon is hope Solomon. I did say Solomon. Solom. I knew I was going to say Solomon. Solomon um, really will, will take us into the, the next generation of. So there's a lot of moving pieces. And, and if you look at the, the design diagram, if you've caught any of Adrian's discussions earlier this week, um, Heat's still a, a fundamental uh, orchestration component in that stack, and, and so it, um, it, it's making rapid progress. Uh, if you've gone to any of the heat sessions or design sessions, packed house, it's, it's something that a lot of people are, are consuming and very interested in the progress of. Okay. So when we combine the heat with the next gentleman down the, the, the thing, Sam, um, then we we take to the next part of um, our conversation is bringing Docker online into this this universe of OpenShift. And can you tell us uh, one of the questions that I've been getting asked is what's the difference um, between a VM and Docker, and what's the value add of using Docker's as containers? I mean that would be a good way to yeah. get into that. Yeah. So um, what I, I would say is that um, containers are basically more lightweight uh, than VMs and portable. So, for instance, you can deploy hundreds of uh, containers really quickly on the machine in like a few milliseconds. And um, portable in the sense that whether you go for um, provisioning on bare metal or on a VM, uh, Docker will make sure that you will deploy your containers uh, or always in the same way. Um, so, yeah. And also, containers are easy to distribute uh, with Docker. Um, we have something called the Docker registry. And so we have um, a containers format. Um, and so your containers are always the same. And, and thanks to the registry, they are easy to, to deploy anywhere. Okay. There's, there's another fundamental difference to the way that containers work to the way that VMs work. In a VM, you're pre-allocating a set of uh, memory and other resources in order to run an environment. Yep. You get an entire operating system. With a container, you're getting a slice of the kernel. And your memory utilization is only what that individual process or group of processes within the container is consuming. So your total utilization of a machine can be much better with a grouping of containers than it can be with a grouping of virtual machines. So it's a way to get a better usage at, or better utility out of a set of equipment. So that brings me to asking you a question to maybe in a nutshell try and describe how Solemn is going to work. With, how, tell us, tell us in, in your words and, and, and why you're so, so enthusiastic about it. Not everybody here has been yeah, to so. all of the uh, unconferences and everything that we've been to, so maybe give a quick. OK, Solem is a new project. Um, it's a little bit special because it's one of the first OpenStack, I think it is the first OpenStack related project that has ever started with zero lines of code. And we're proud of that. And let me explain, let me, you're all laughing because you think that's funny. Um, but it's not funny. It's, it's actually the one thing that makes this project really, really interesting 
because it, normally when you have an open source project, somebody has made all of the important decisions already. And you get to this point where it's at its MVP status, it's actually doing something, it's working, it's almost finished when it gets announced. And there really isn't an opportunity to change very much. When you come out with just an idea and you say, look, these are some gaps that we see that are in our, are in our ecosystem that we care about, and we need to get better in these areas, and we want to focus on these areas. We have this plan for what we want to build, but we want to get input from all the subject matter experts and build the best possible one we can. And almost everybody who's involved in this project, if you go to solum.io, the website, the community website, you'll see the logos of the people who are, who are involved in this. About, that, that's about to double since we've uh, you know, started talking about this more openly um, with a wider audience. Every single one of these companies had built some kind of platform as a service solution in the past, or some kind of a deployment solution in the past, or some kind of a, uh, is a you know, container technology uh, company. So they, they all have something that they're bringing that's valuable. And so what we're going to end up with what we're done, when we're done is something way better than if any one of us would have built something in isolation and then come and said, here's this wonderful magical solution that's going to solve all your problems. So that's a great description of all the people coming together to that, but can you describe a little bit more what the, the vision and goal sure. is that you set out for, for Solom? Solom? Sure. So there's a, few, there's a few key focuses. The first is, how do you, in the world where um, agile development is becoming more and more popular, and people are learning more and more how to do this kind of iterative development, and at the same time, we've got this trend of uh, you know, an insatiable desire for cloud technology, how do you get those worlds to work together? How do you make it really easy for somebody to develop software and get that software from source code all the way to built and running on the cloud? And how do you make that super low friction? And how do you have tools that make it so that people love to, love to write code on an open stack versus some other clouded uh, ecosystem? Another area is an area of application portability. So if you have an application that runs on your private cloud and you want to run that application on a public cloud, there should be a way to easily forklift that and move it. Today, past solutions are generally biased to one or another uh, of these worlds. They're either focused primarily on private cloud or they're focused primarily on hosted in a public cloud environment, and there's not a great story about an equivalency between them. So one of Solom's focuses is getting this equivalency between a, a public and private cloud scenario and making a real story so that you can actually get things that work in both equally well. So where is the, the line between heat and solemn? So, he, so heat is primarily about orchestration. Um, it's about getting the resources in the cloud set up in accordance with a model that you built. Solom is about taking source code, putting it through a CI and CD process, giving you the ability to do things like Get your code built, reviewed, staged, tested, gated, to the point where you generate a heat template, and then you start doing your continuous deployment things, which are feeding it into the, into the actual cloud and getting it set up on the cloud, monitoring it, scaling it, healing it when it breaks, those sorts of things. So there's a whole, th there's a whole set of things that happen before you even generate a heat template that Solom is concerned about. It's also concerned about things like when you deploy initially, you're probably going to deploy, after you've gated all your testing, you want to deploy into a, into a test environment or a staging environment before you go production with your app. And it needs to be super easy to go from production status, from test status to production status. And you need to have something that's going to help you kind of walk through those stages and make that super easy for you to do. All right. So that brings me to the next one. Where is the, the line, Clayton, perhaps you can just to, to do this part of it, the line between OpenShift and Solom. So when we uh, think about what OpenShift does today, OpenShift is totally focused on the developer experience, making it easy for a developer to uh, build and deploy applications and run those in a number of ways. But one of the things that we've done, which was a deliberate choice, was to try and limit uh, the variables to make it so that the fundamentals worked easily and you had a flow. And what we found over time um, with the evolution of Docker and as OpenStack has grown, so you know, when we started OpenShift um, just over two and a half years ago now, almost three, um, 
OpenStack was really in its infancy, was growing. There was a number of the smaller projects. And as OpenStack has matured and uh, Docker has come along and really demonstrated um, how you can build a really compelling experience around taking a set of software, a process, an application, and bundling it in a way that's easily portable uh, and works across any Linux, uh, any Linux kernel, you really have these two uh, almost intersecting forces that allow you to say, uh, with OpenShift, we want to keep evolving. We want to expose more capabilities. We want to build a better platform as a service. And so as we look through all the things that we wanted to build, we realized the kinds of capabilities we want and the kinds of features that we want to expose to end users are the exact, si exact same sort of capabilities uh, that exist in OpenStack um, to build upon the stack to give you know, everyone, not just the developer, um, but the IT administrator and the organization itself, the, the ability to put together and to run the application lifecycle and the entire IT infrastructure. And so when Project Solon came, came around, uh, when we started looking at it, it matched almost exactly the things that we wanted to see out of the next evolution of OpenShift. So we're incredibly excited to be part of this because, you know, again, as Adrian says, um, it allows us to offload a lot of the things that have already either been solved or are solved better than they had ever been in the past because a bunch of different people are coming together and trying to find the right solution uh, in an open way. Cool. Thanks. So one of the other questions, that, oh, we have a question here? Cool. So maybe, so maybe we could get Clayton. Yeah, sure. Go for it. Okay. Um, I could, I, let, let me paraphrase Oops. that as why Oops. not. <laughs> Too hard. Throw that back to that man for asking the question. paraphrase that question as why not just use OpenShift? Why do you need something new? Is that, is that your question? So, but maybe. Yeah, I don't understand. I don't understand what you're referring to as brokering. Can you explain that? So. So it. So Adrian, why don't we let Chris try and well, answer that? At least let me hit on part of that question because it, I, I think it's two or three parts there. Number one is the, the goal that Heat has is to be an infrastructure orchestrator. It is, it is not get in the business of the entire life cycle from writing code to building code to testing code, putting it through the entire process before it, it, to include getting to production and through environments. That is not what Heat's going to do. So that's, that's, that was the first question that you asked. Now, now we look at, well, what is the platform as a service additive and the differential between OpenShift and the idea of Solem? OpenShift is a rel and derivative based solution um, we use completely different well we use 
technologies such as SE Linux, PAM namespaces. Um, we used a concept of, um, we call them gears, they're directories with permissions around them too. And, and we use C groups to isolate processes, et cetera. That's not portable. That doesn't, that doesn't give us the ability to... to that is what you chose to, if you are continuing along with the... No, no, no. So, so what we're looking at now is a technical pivot, right? So the, the idea of, of managing, picking a new technology to replace isolation and multi-tenancy and, and something on, that has parity with the lightweight concept of a directory or a gear that being a container and how you would manage that and, and how you fit that into an entire PaaS lifecycle or an application lifecycle management, that is the technical pivot point. So you can't just say, well, I'm going to rip and replace op the OpenShift PaaS with the existing OpenStack projects because there's still a lot of work to do. And that, that block of work is what Solum intends to put together. That, w that was just one example of Chris. a slice of the technology. So uh, I think, you know, and Chris pointed this out, is containerization has evolved a ton in the last three years. And so one of the things we'd been doing internally was starting to evaluate the next steps about where containers are going, you know, you know on the RHEL team, um, you know, some of the guys who are um, doing SE Linux and contributing to libvirt LXC. And there's a lot of internal iteration. We said, you know, there's, a, there's an opportunity here with Docker to join with um, the things that Docker brings on top, which is you know, incremental addition and some of the, the packaging aspects around containers that's better than what we have today. And so you know, to us, it's a natural migration on that aspect. And then you know, I'll hand this over to Adrian, but all of the capabilities that are important to an IT administrator, the developer wants one view of the world and many IT administrators want to remove or certainly limit the kinds of choices developers have to make both for you know, operational concerns, organizational concerns. And so we want to expose more capabilities to the IT administrator and OpenStack is the right place to expose IT administration. So what happens if the containerization goes into Linux kernel? Containerization is... Yeah, here is container, it's part of the kernel. Yep. So if you So basically the technologies that we used uh, to create the OpenShift gear, where we had C groups and namespacing and all of those, those have already been pushed into the kernel and they are called kernel namespaces under Linux. Docker is, all, is basically using those technologies and it's adding another layer on top to make it very easy to create redistrib redistributable images, you know, packaging, uh, which makes it very easy for, say, uh, a software developer, uh, a MySQL person to create a little MySQL uh, package that can be distributed to other passes and they can run easily over there. So the, the namespacing and all of that is already in the kernel. This is basically a way of packaging and, um, and in, in Solemn, we are using Docker's technology, use, using that packaging to make it easy uh, to migrate those, uh, well, we call them cartridges in Solemn, they'll be called something else. No, to migrate those. So what, what, there's another question down in front here. Um, I just keep hearing uh, Linux is Linux kernel. So when you type out the type form as a service, do you guys uh, support uh, Microsoft uh, platform as a service? How do you do that? So I think there's an evolution here that'll happen. Um, you know, OpenStack certainly can support Windows VMs running on hypervisors. Containers are a concept that's specific to Linux today. Um, there is some work going on out in the communities to do the same kinds of things as containers, maybe without the same kernel level integration. But I think, and, and I'll you know hand this over to Adrian, I think that there's, um, I think the important thing, the step that, that Solon brings is because it's dependent on heat, it offers a lot more flexibility in how it can deal with the kinds of things that it, OpenStack already supports. So you don't have to use container technology. Um, it's compelling, 
because it, it's more effective to run your infrastructure on containers. It's faster to turn them on. It's easier to move them around. The images are smaller. They can be layered. There's all kinds of technical reasons why containers are interesting. But you wouldn't necessarily have to use a container if you were interested in running uh, you know, a platform, an operating system platform that doesn't offer the feature. So if what you really want to do is build in .NET and deploy through a cloud and have it turn on virtual machines that run Microsoft operating system and Microsoft um, application stacks, that's absolutely possible. But you still, you still need all the features about having an API that allows you to abstract your cloud, to be able to represent your application, to be able to export and import between public and private clouds. All of that stuff still applies the same way. Solem doesn't care about operating system. Containers are an operating system feature offered by Linux today. But these things are, are separate issues. I think extension is really important here, right? When we talk about what we want Solem to be, we want it to be the big tent. So you know, a lot of PaaS operators and implementations up to this point have chosen things that allow them to deliver specific types of options. And I think waiting for part of what makes OpenStack um, you know, amazing is the vendor neutrality, right? The idea that where necessary, you solve a problem in a way that lets everybody participate. And so continuous integration flows that are based around Windows, I don't see any reason why um, the Solon project could not um, you know, have people contributing who believe very strongly in those sorts of solutions. Like, and, and this is, you know, when Adrian says there's no lines of code, part of the goal is to, to kind of gather a lot of people who have a lot of experience in a lot of different ways with application lifecycle management paths and to come together and bring, you know, build out the kind of the core things that we all believe in, um, source code, continuous integration, continuous deployment, reusing the infrastructure and giving IT administrators those pieces to work with. So I think I saw another question too. This, Rob? So I have a pair of questions in this. One is, why did you choose to bypass the OpenStack incubation process? And the second is, why do you It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a development collaboration. It is a project. It is not a software distribution of software. It's not an OpenStack project. It is an, it is, its designation is called OpenStack Related. An OpenStack Related project is when an OpenStack team gets together to work on something together where they have not yet filed for incubation. Yeah, so we're In order to file for incubation, you need to have something to submit. Yeah. I think the thing that we have to be careful with the language that we use when we describe where we're at and what stage we're at in the project. And we are working, we're getting together in a couple of weeks to work further on a blueprint to move this forward to be a, you know, if we get consensus among the group, a blueprint to submit with some code base to become a valid OpenStack project. I think that's the course of action we're working on, but we're not there yet. And that's the point I think Rob's trying to make. Well, so I think when we say, I think there might be a little bit of confusion when we say what we want to support. You know, the idea is to build something that's OpenStack first. And you can't build something OpenStack first by taking a bunch of images and running it on OpenStack. Like, that's not OpenStack, right? OpenStack is a process. It's a community. It's, um, it's a contract between the companies and the developers and the open source community. And so, you know, when we think about, you know, OpenShift is, is almost separate from this. When we think about what we want Solon to be, I, as an OpenShift developer, I want to help build the best possible experience for end users, developers, IT administrators that takes advantage of everything in OpenStack. And you can't take advantage of everything in OpenStack by retrofitting. I mean, I, I really firmly believe, um, and I think this is why 
we responded so strongly to this. We really believe that you know, there's, a, there's a layer on top that's the experience. When you talk about fundamentals and how something works, if you're not building on heat, why are you in OpenStack? If you're not using Nova, why are you in OpenStack? If you're not using Keystone and Glance, and these things give what... Yeah, but there, I think the point that, that Clayton is trying to make is that to use the resources natively to OpenStack um, as part and parcel of that, that the project. Of, it had to begin, right? OpenStack. Yeah. When you did OpenStack, you wanted to do an open source, right? That's how you began with And you did make it on platform as the but as, but as the technologies evolve and as OpenStack has evolved. <laughs> We, we, yes. So this time, how we're going about it is collaboratively. We're designing with other platform as a service vendors, other cloud hosting providers, other people interested in this space. So as opposed to doing it as just the OpenShift community, we're bringing in a whole lot of other people and collaborating. And that's part of why we're here today with, with all these. There's a, another question here. Is this, you have a question? Uh, this is uh, on the merits of the containers, because generally containers share a slice of the kernel, uh, that makes them fast and efficient, but that makes them also prone to anything which others might do to the kernel. So are you building any kind of high availability just to make sure that if something goes down, uh, it is taken up somewhere else? Uh, is it in the plan, something like that? So this is, uh, the subject of high availability is something Feed is already, is already uh, you know, it has in its roadmap the ability to do multi-region deployments. There are open blueprints for this. As soon as OpenStack offers the ability to do this and Heat surfaces those capabilities, you need features in Nova, you need features in Heat, you need features in order to do that. Once those are surfaced, Solom will consume those. There was another question, question right here. Here you go. Yeah. So this has more to do with newly developed applications. So this is about how do you make an application, a, a newly developed application, somebody that is building from source code, the ability to get their source code into fully built running on the cloud status. So, so, so it's not about packaging up existing applications necessarily. I mean, you could package an application in a container image, submit it to the Solom API, it would generate a heat template, the heat orchestration system would deploy resources, those resources would get the bits and you would have your deployed application. Another option would be you bundle up your application into a heat template and you deploy that directly to heat and you bypass us completely. It's, it's definitely not out of the realm of possibility though for legacy application build deployment uh, and associated infrastructure. Anything that um, at the OS level that your application is going to run on, it's still a fundamental, it, it, at the end of the day, is the runtime environment. Um, the, the, the Solon project or even OpenShift today, uh, you know, that, that's the framework. But at the end of the day, the runtime environment, uh, whatever, whatever is supported and packaged. Yeah, there's an interesting you know, crossover here is that to, to take advantage of some of the things that cloud offer, to take advantage of high availability. You know, there's certain ways that you have to build your application. You don't just get it for free. And so with legacy applications, there's really probably two types. There's the type where you know, there's things that are isolated in such a way that, as Chris was saying, they can run, you, know, you can take maybe a C++ application that listens on a network port. You can probably bundle that up into a Docker image, right? That's something you can do today. And then Solom's really about giving you the flow into that process, and as Adrian said, linking it together. So there's a number of options, and it really just depends on what kind of application you have. There may be legacy applications that could very easily be converted, and there's some that may not be. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I, I see actually, uh, when we introduce cloud computing customer, especially in terms of telecom, bank, like 
This is something you know at, at Red Hat we believe pretty strongly in. So when we talk about OpenShift, we talk about the long tail of IT computing, right? There's a, everyone has hundreds and thousands of IT applications that run in their infrastructure, and I think that over time, what we want to evolve in, you know, this is something we we do to some degree in OpenShift, and this is something that Solom will eventually take up in various forms. Is patterns and mechanisms by which there's best practices and flows that allow people to convert. You know, the the focus today for Solem, right, is to build a kernel that you can build an ecosystem around and to, to get those pieces in place, the pieces that, you know, everybody in the community can agree on um, and, you know, the best practices that people have come to, the ability to use Docker, the ability to use OpenStack natively. And it'll take some time to get to that next stage for Solem where you can take legacy applications. People will be out there, vendors will be out there that make it easy to make that transition. So there's another question out here. here. Go ahead. Yeah, so you mentioned building an ecosystem and uh, I'm a core developer, and I get a pretty uncomfortable question from some people in, in our uh, open stack related world, which is that we're damaging the ecosystem by having tools like Heat integrated into open stack or having a solo where we have some of the components of things that exist outside of open stack that we want to integrate with it. And I'm just wondering how you guys answer that question. It's open stack related because there, are, there isn't something to submit for incubation. I'm always going to be very clear about this. If the community wants Solem to be incubated, it can ask for it to be incubated, and it will become incubated. Yeah. But it's about, right now, it's about making it work. So um, that didn't answer my question. Maybe I didn't state it correctly. Um, for instance, uh, somebody who's got an existing OpenStack cloud with uh, Cloud Foundry available for it, I'm not mentioning my employer for HP, but um, they're now sort of threatened by, by tools that are coming with open tech, sort of included, batteries included, right? And they already had batteries. So it's it puts us in an uncomfortable position. I'm developing a heat because I need it. I need it for deploying open tech, oddly enough. But I'm just curious if, if so, you also have that question of, you know, how do you feel about that? Like, there's already paths out there. I'm so, gonna so let me answer it this way. Okay. How, how, I'm just, just mention that um, I know that you're, you're with HP, yes. so the Active State Staccato group is actually working and participating in this. Um, okay. this uh, so just so you, just so you know, there, there are other folks out there um, who see the value in having a common API and a, a, way, a common way for everyone to use these building blocks for PaaS or PaaS functionality. And that's more of how I see Solemn rolling out. It's not an either or choice. Yeah. Red Hat is Red Hat is a pass provider. Active State is a pass provider. Um, uh, Cloudify is working with Cumulogic us. Logic is, a, is yeah. a pass provider. I mean, many of the of the participants in Solo are pass providers and are already using OpenStack as downstream. Uh, okay, but there are many that aren't, and, and they're they're concerned. So that's that's what I'm. Thinking. I guess I would almost ask, you know, what's the concern, right? Is it the concern that it takes? focus and attention away from the OpenStack community. And I think that you know, that's one of the benefits of the OpenStack community, right? There's a bunch of people who often have different competing interests working together, right? So I don't think Solem should steal time and attention away from core developers. I think it really comes down to, you know, what is it that the developers and the companies that are working with OpenStack believe in? You know, do, do they find value in coming together and leveraging the platform more fully? It, you know, people can go deploy OpenShift or Cloud Foundry on top of OpenStack today. And to us, it seems pretty clear that there's a very natural evolution in the PaaS space. To have this, I, I think of it like, you know, I think of it as this, this, uh, this set of levels. So you talk about like the OSI network stack, you got level seven all the way up here, which is your applications, and you got a bunch of wires down here. And I think that's what OpenStack represents, is OpenStack today has gone one through three or five, but at the end of the day, you know, everybody in the IT organization is trying to get applications deployed or they're trying to run software. Like OpenStack is, is there today to run software and you know, over time it's just gonna become more natural for people to want to build better software on top of OpenStack because if you hide all those details, you end up not being able to take advantage of them. And I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up my question because I'm taking a lot of time. I, I agree with all of that and actually um, the concern that's expressed to me often is that by uh, seeking incubation and getting a stamp on it, uh, Heat now has
also grow ourselves too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to let the gentleman behind you ask a question. <laughs> Hopefully not because I can't so, pronounce it, so no. When we think about this from a technical perspective, right? So all of the things that we want to do, all the capabilities that we want to enable in OpenShift are things that OpenStax are doing. I don't want to go rewrite that. Like I don't want to bring federation. I don't want to write federation. I want to use Keystone. And there's kind of a, you know, the things that we believe that we do the best is the developer experience and packaging and distributing software. And so we want to help bring those aspects of what we're familiar with to the Solem project. And we would like to use Solem and become more deeply integrated with OpenStack over time. That's a transitional thing. You know, obviously, you know, with no lines of code, you know, it's kind of hard to say, well, we're going to switch over tomorrow. But in the long run, we want to be, you know, have something that works just as well as OpenShift does today for all scenarios and then offers all these new capabilities to users and then users. And I think that that's the same way that many of the other vendors who are involved feel, you know, the customers and the, and the people who are involved in the project, they want to see uh, capabilities that kind of span the stack. So we want to give it to them. Cool. Yeah, so we've, additive. we've got time for one more question. The gentleman in the orange, right there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. That was a good short answer. That w I guess that now we have more time for it. There was one more question over there. This gentleman with the glasses and the. Yes. So I was curious. Uh, in the in the vision of Solom, added something that controls uh, the storage. Uh, this this uh, this uh, this containers. Would those containers be on a virtual machine or on a bare metal? It doesn't matter. It can be in a virtual machine, or it can be on bare metal. It depends on what the cloud operator prefers. Okay. Christian, did you want to? There was a, there was a really interesting discussion that's going to go on, you know, how do containers fit into Nova. Some of the design sessions today talked about that. It's just, you know, everybody, you know, containers are something that's new, and there's no right answers. About, like a VM is not a container, and there's a lot of, you know, legacy there. But uh, from an application perspective, um, a VM, something that's a compute resource, is a place to deploy and run something. And I think we want to be flexible to those options. Clayton accidentally said that containers are new. Sorry. Um, which isn't <laughs> <laughs> But he, what he meant is that there's been a resistance to using containers because they've lacked certain isolation and certain namespaces. They haven't, uh, they haven't really started to see a lot of traction until now. I would ask a question to Sam, why do you think there's such an interest in Docker now, and why is container technology taking off where it hasn't in the last five years? Yeah, so actually that's interesting because we, we have been running containers on production on the past at Dot .cloud for three years, and we were basically supporting uh, thousands of applications on prod, and so Docker is actually um, the result of that. We made a lot of mistakes, and by seeing Docker on Solom right now, it's, it's, I think it's a great thing because it brings a mature approach of running containers directly for free from the beginning of the project. And I think containers are taking off right now because it's, it's easier to, to, uh, to run them. I um, mean, by the time we were running containers on, on dot .cloud, we uh, were relying on, on kernel patches and asking people to patch their kernel to use Docker is uh, really painful, so it's not the case anymore. Um, so yeah, basically they are they are easier to e easy they are more easy to use now. Yeah, and I have to apologize for saying new, but it's the idea I think of the container as something that can stand on its own that people are running in production and people learn from the mistakes. That's a you know a natural part of every software pr process. You know, and, and for the um, for Red Hats, you know the the folks we have on the kernel team who are working on this, who've been working on this for years, you know, kind of taking these final sets of steps that allow us to work with Docker and to put some of these pieces together, um, like libvirt, or libvirt LXC and libvirt drivers and um, SE Linux, you know, even AppArmor, you know, all of these things are capabilities that are coming together in a way that give application developers um, something they probably never had in such an easy to use package with Docker before, which is the ability to take a process and a user space and run that anywhere. 
I mean, that's, that's huge, right? You can't, you can't do that today, and Docker has made, Docker's really made that process as simple as possible, and I think that's really the shift that I see. Yeah. Yeah, also, something I'd like to add is that right now, Docker uh, has, has an ecosystem. Uh, it's basically 200 of contributors and thousands of ap applications on our public registry, and by having Docker in OpenStack and in Solom, uh, we are also bringing this ecosystem with us. Um, so, yeah, I think Solom can basically take the advantage of that. Yeah. So I, I think we, we need to wrap up a little bit, but this has really been, what we're seeing is this whole evolution. And six months ago we were in Portland and we were just talking about heat. We were barely talking about Docker. And now um, the next conference is in Atlanta. And six months from now, we have a lot that we've committed to, we're talking about. So it's gonna be very interesting to have this same session in six months don't um, commit us to anything. I'm not committing you to anything, Solom. Um, but at least, you know, some there there to Solom, I think, by the time six months comes around. And can, Adrian, can you tell the dates of the, the next Solom session in San uh, we Francisco? We have a face-to-face -face meeting um, happening in San Francisco November 19th and 20th. So if you are interested and want to be part of this uh, development uh, collaboration, you're welcome to attend. Uh, look on the OpenStack mailing, developer mailing list for the link to the invitation. Okay, and it'll also be on solemn.io, yes. and there's a few other... When is it? Where? It's in San Francisco at the Rackspace office downtown, 620 Folsom. Yeah, so there's a couple of... If you go to solemn.io, the date will be up there eventually when it's firmer. Um, this is where you can get in, all, information on all of these things. Um, they're out there. The heat templates that we talked about earlier that are in productions are on in GitHub under OpenStack under heat templates. You can grab them there. Um, what we're really looking forward to is getting all of you to collaborate with us on whatever it is this next generation of platform as a service features, functionality is on OpenStack and helping us uh, collaborate and design the next step. So thank you very much and thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you.